All right, so we will get started. Very special welcome to everybody who is tuning in for yet another EBFA educational webinar. So very excited about this one uh, that we're doing tonight. This actually uh, is actually long overdue. Last time that we put something out similar to this was way back in January 2012 when I did my first webinar focusing on barefoot training, a lot of the research, and if there was a need for barefoot training guidelines. So there's some very exciting research that we're going to be reviewing, and um, I'm actually glad that I did this webinar because I found out some uh, tweaks that I can do specifically to short foot exercise to get a little bit better results with my patients and in my classes. So even I learned a ton of information. So before we get started, if you are not familiar with who I am, my name is Dr. Emily Splickle. I am a podiatrist in New York City, a human movement specialist. I'm the founder of the Evidence-Based Fitness Academy. Our website is on the bottom of this uh, first page, so please do check us out online. We are on all of the different social media channels, and we offer both live workshops as well as home study workshops built around barefoot science, from the ground up, foot typing, and of course, gait assessment. The way that it works with these webinars is that they are all recorded, they are archived, and they are found on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash EBFA Fitness. If you want the link to that YouTube, it will be sent to you at the end. And if you want this actual PowerPoint or this PDF, then please know that you can email me at education at ebfafitness.com. I would highly recommend that you do request this, this PDF because these citations that I will be referencing uh, are going to be included for each of the research articles. If you do want to check them out a little bit more in detail, I would encourage you to do so. So again, education at ebfafitness.com. I'm going to run through the PowerPoint and then we will answer any questions that you may have at the end. So let's get started. So again, as I had already mentioned, we had first launched the Barefoot Training Specialist Certification in January 2012. At that time, a lot of the focus around barefoot training, barefoot movement, was around barefoot running. Pretty much every research article that you would see around 2010, 2012, maybe a little bit earlier, was really heavy focused on barefoot running big thing about EBFA is that we try to bring barefoot beyond running. So we're looking at the power of foot activation, foot to core integration. We use a lot of short foot exercise, so we'll be referencing some of the latest research related to that. We look at uh, footwear surfaces, how the body stops those uh, vibrations as they're entering the body. So we bring it much further beyond just barefoot running kinematics and does running barefoot uh, translate to running in minimal shoes, and, and etc. Other big thing when you look at past barefoot research is a, a lot of barefoot research actually dates back to the 1970s. And a lot of the research that was done around that time, so 70s and 80s, was by a Dr. Stephen Robbins. Um, I used to reference him a lot more in the beginning of the EBFA education. And then we've just evolved a lot more beyond just uh, footwear and fall reduction. However, just know a lot of the initial barefoot research back back 70s and 80s focused on fall reductions, proprioception, um, and the impact that it has on older adults. So we are proceeding forward. A lot of the research that I'm going to be referencing, I tried to stay in 2013 through 2016. However, there were a few studies that I did want to reference that were in 2012. So just know that they are within the last four to five years, so they would be much more on the current end of things. First area that we're going to look is barefoot training and balance. First study specifically that we want to look at is the effect of wearing athletic shoes. Vibrams or barefoot on balanced performance in young adults. And anytime you're looking at research, what's important to consider is the subject size or the sample size. Any research that has a very small sample size is obviously not going to have um, a lot of strength to their 
to their results. So we always do want to be looking at research with a critical eye and you always want to have several research studies kind of supporting the exact same results. So we'll think of this as an initial exploration. So here this particular research study 2015 looked at 49 subjects testing the balance in barefoot Vibrams and traditional athletic shoes. Eyes were open and closed. What they saw, sorry for this typo, is that there was a decrease in medial lateral and anterior posterior sway in the Vibrams versus the athletic shoes. The, there was an increase in sway between Vibrams and barefoot, which makes sense because barefoot you have the most plantar stimulation. What this research study concluded is that Vibrams, or minimal shoes in general, would kind of say, provided a greater transition between athletic shoes and barefoot. So most of you who are listening, probably everybody who's listening, is a proponent on minimal footwear. A lot of you probably do wear Vibrams already. So you know that uh, you are going to see an increase in stability. This research study might help, even though in here they had used young adults, I would use this as a research study to try to pull some of your seniors or older adults in the direction of minimal footwear if they are refusing to be barefoot. The advantage of the Vibram over other minimal shoes is that it does have the five finger uh, format or pockets. We're going to be looking at toe flexor strength in a couple other studies and if you have each of the digits separated you could theoretically argue that you get a little bit more activation of those toe flexors. So again, first study that we are looking at there. Next study is that we are looking at the comparison of barefoot versus shod rehab exercises for chronic ankle instability and what they were looking at is balance measures and intrinsic foot strength. This is a 2013 study, 20 subjects, again not super high, they tried to find people with two lateral ankle sprains in five years. Not too high of a rate, um, three week intervention is a very low intervention. Most uh, research articles will look at a six to eight week intervention period as far as looking for results. Anytime I send my patients to rehab, I don't want them to come back to me until they have that six to eight weeks because you're, you're just not going to see as, as much of a results. So a couple things as far as when we're looking at it. They did 30 minutes three times a week. So what they noted was, and the foot strengthening exercise that they did was short foot. So during this three week progressive, they noticed that there was an increase or an improvement in the uh, subjective foot and ankle um, assessment questionnaire. So that was pretty much their subjective uh, perception on how, how more stable um, they feel. Uh, as well as the strength of the foot intrinsics and I'm going to go into specifically how they tested the intrinsic muscle strength in a couple other studies. So they did see a benefit. When you look at this research study a little bit closer, so if you do want to again please email me for the PowerPoint, is that they did actually see some pretty decent improvement of barefoot versus shod they saw an improvement in the shot as well versus their control. So obviously doing balance and foot strengthening exercises is important. If you're doing them shod and you're not barefoot, you are still seeing a benefit. So at least that's great. Ideally, we do want to get our patients and our clients out of those shoes because there was a greater improvement when we were in that full barefoot environment. These were the exercises that they did, single leg bounces on a trampoline, on a balance board. For those who take uh, EBFA education follows, we know that these two programs here, even though you are barefoot, you're tapping in a lot more in the um, large nerve proprioceptors versus the small nerve proprioceptors. Short foot here, they did 25 reps times 10 sets. So when you're looking at the volume, um, perhaps think about the amount of volume that you're doing right now in short foot. Are you actually repping it out? Or are you just tying in short foot in different exercises? Something that you want to think about. When we think about towel crunches, this is an exercise that I actually do not like because it strengthens much more of the long toe flexors versus the short toe flexors. We'll go into that a little bit more as well. And then uh, calf raises. If you're doing these calf raises, I would tie in short foot with that. 
Next area that we want to look at a little bit closer, which obviously is going to tie into a lot of the things that we speak about, is short foot exercise. So, this is a very interesting study. This study, this was my 2012 that I had to include, looked at the importance of measuring intrinsic foot muscle strength as well as some of the challenges and the different way of measuring it. This is uh, important for those who are not in a clinical setting of how you can still test and assess your client's intrinsic foot muscle strength. Huge thing that we want to think about is your flexor hallucis brevis, which runs underneath the great toe, can exert 36% of your body weight during push-off. So that's, that's kind of gauging how much of its strength can it generate. Your flexor digitorum brevis, which inserts into the lesser four digits, has only 13%. So the flexor hallucis brevis is actually three times as strong as your flexor digitorum brevis. So when we do our cueing of short foot, I always cue to focus on the great toe. All of the digits are important, but just know that if you feel most of your strength is in your great toe or underneath where that flexor hallucis brevis is acting, it makes sense because that muscle is just three times as strong as a flexor digitorum brevis. So cueing it around the great toe is totally appropriate. Now when it comes to the other intrinsics, can we really isolate out flexor hallucis brevis versus flexor digitorum brevis versus the other uh, intrinsic muscles? It's a little bit difficult. Um, the interossei and the lumbar claws, which are also in the bottom of the foot, assist in flexion as well. So almost like how your core musculature contracts as a unit and it's very hard to isolate out um, TVA versus the obliques and uh, rectus abdominis and pelvic floor and how these, they're, they're really designed to co-contract. You want to think of the foot in the exact same way. Your intrinsic muscles are designed to all co-contract to really enhance that push-off position, that lever of the foot. A couple ways of how intrinsic foot muscle strength is measured so that you understand these research studies and the um, the transferability of some of these results is by understanding how they're actually testing it. So some research studies will use what's called a dynamometry, which looks something like this. So essentially they're measuring the amount of force that's being produced at a joint. This particular study that is using this dynamometry is going to be referenced soon. So this is one way, this is obviously in a very heavy research setting, I wouldn't even be measuring my patient's uh, toe flexor strength with this because it's again very heavy research based. The way that you can do it, which is a very um, easy way to do it, is a paper grip test. And this is a test that's done with a lot of patients who have neurological conditions such as neuropathies, uh, cerebral palsy, etc. And if you put a piece of paper, you can put a business card underneath the great toe. Remember, the great toe is really what we're focused on. And you're trying to see that they can hold the toe down without you pulling the paper out. Super, super easy. But it can be done in a setting that is where probably most of us are in. Another way that you can do it is what's called a plantar pressure test. This is uh, an example of how I did on, we have a force plate in my office, and the picture on the left is, it's actually me standing, so I'm standing without engaging, so I'm in a relaxed uh, stance position, and then when I engage short foot, you can see that it is lighting up underneath the tip of the hallux, so that's showing that there is activation and strength under the flexor hallucis brevis. What this also shows is that the lesser digits here, even though you see that they light up with the green, they're not going to the same level of red pressure as the hallux, which again is showing that three times the strength of the flexor hallucis brevis. Another study, 2014, is looking at the immediate effect of short foot exercise on dynamic balance of subjects in excessively or with excessively pronated feet. So again, this had a smaller subject size. What they were using as their measure of overpronation is something that we want to 
seriously think about. Um, this is how I measure overpronation, navicular drop. If you've taken, again, any of my workshops, I focus a lot on navicular drop by simply looking at um, arch and saying, you know, you have a flat foot, you have no arch, therefore you have an overpronated foot, um, is highly oversimplifying it. You want an actual measure that you can follow. The way that you assess for navicular drop is, um, I believe I did a blog on this, but if you measure the foot in open chain, and you put it at a 90 degree angle mimicking that you're on the ground and you measure the height of the navicular relative to your ground or the bottom of the foot and then you compare that to the patient or client standing up and you measure that height of the navicular to the ground and if you see a greater than 10 millimeter difference that is a pathological navicular drop. That we know is going to have an effect on the posterior tibialis, the deep front line, pelvic floor stability, etc. So that's what they were looking here at their measure. They were then looking at balance in a medial lateral sway. What they saw is doing short foot exercise improved the dynamic balance in excessively pronated feet. So in our clients who have navicular drop and you are at the beginning of a session and perhaps they're a little bit older, so balance is of great concern, fall reduction, integrating and starting all of your balance exercises with some targeted short foot exercise would be advantageous because it's going to actually give them better performance throughout the rest of that balance program. This is something that we want to think about. Another thing that we want to look at is, this is another study in 2012, potential of human toe flexor muscles to produce force. So now this is important because when we do our push off and when we think about short foot and um, pushing against the ground, power release, etc. we always want to be thinking about the long flexors versus the short flexors. Remember the towel crunch exercise that a lot of people do, that's probably one of the most common uh, foot strengthening exercises in kind of like a traditional sense or a physical therapy sense is towel crunches. I don't know who started this exercise, there's absolutely no research behind it and it's really reinforcing for the, the toe flexors to pull in when we want to think about the fact that our toe flexors work by rooting or keeping our digits flat against the ground so that we can push against the ground when we take a step. So here this is looking at our toe flexor strength force. When we look at our long toe flexors, so your flexor hallucis brevis actually produces 61% of your body weight starting in mid stance. Your flexors, your short flexors are not active until your heel leaves the ground. What's happening once your heel starts to leave the ground is you are essentially dorsiflexing your digits. So it's something too important that we want to think about. What this study saw is that if you changed the angle of the ankle and the angle of the digits or the MPJs, they actually saw a difference in the amount of strength or force that was produced by the flexors. So now where they saw the greatest amount of flexor strength was when the ankle was either in zero degrees or a 10 degree dorsiflexion and the digits had to be dorsiflexed 25 to 45 degrees. What's interesting is if the ankle was plantar flexed and the MPJs were not dorsiflexed, then they actually saw the lowest amount of force produced. So again, ankle plantar flexion, toes stay neutral, they saw the least amount. And you can actually test that on yourself right now. If you stand up and you uh, put your legs straight out, it's almost like you're doing a rotational lunge and you plant or flex your ankle and your digits stay flat on the ground so you're kind of leaning back and then you try to push your toes down into the ground and do a short foot, you can, I'm doing it right now and I can feel that it's a great difference in the amount of force I can create underneath my toes 
versus being a little bit dorsiflexed and how I feel that completely different. We're going to see soon that the way that we actually use our flexors and you actually get a higher flexor strength is by plantar flexing the ankle and dorsiflexing the digits, which is how we use the foot when we walk. So this exercise, when you plantar flex the ankle and dorsiflex the MPJs, and then you are going to get the greatest toe flexor strength, and it makes sense functionally. So if you have started including this exercise with your clients and with your patients, that is awesome. It is what I consider the king of all foot exercises because it's targeting the deep front line, we're getting the foot in a very functional position, we're getting the foot all the way up into the hip moving, you can get foot to core activation through this exercise. This exercise initially was researched as a posterior tibialis exercise. So they compared this exercise, this type of a heel raise, versus a traditional heel raise without a ball between the heel, and they looked at posterior tibialis activation. As soon as you put the ball between the heel, they saw a higher posterior activation. So now we know that having the ball with the posterior tibialis, which is part of the deep front line, and really activating those flexors is going to get the highest toe flexor strength. So that would be a way to train your uh, greatest power at propulsion. So you want power output, you want to train this exercise. The way that I cue it is as you're coming up, the ball squeezing, squeezing between your heels, is you want to be actively plantar flexing, or sorry, um, yes, actively flexing your digits into the ground. So it's almost like you're engaging short foot as you're coming up, squeezing the ball between the heels. You want to feel contact on the bottom of the digits the entire time. You don't want to just come up and balance on your metatarsal heads. So king of all exercises. Moving forward into our barefoot training and performance. So this one was interesting. This looked at a comparison of back squat kinematics between barefoot and shod conditions. Had a little bit larger group, so 45 subjects, that's good. They looked at uh, subjects squatting barefoot, completely barefoot, or in running shoes. And what they saw is that there were two favorable changes in the kinematics and two unfavorable changes. So um, and the unfavorable results that we'll see, I think, is because of the compromised ankle dorsiflexion that results once you get out of the shoes. So what they saw is the barefoot squat created a greater degree of trunk flexion. So we know that that's a compensation if you have limited ankle dorsiflexion. So um, that's my guess that that's most likely what is happening. They saw a peak thigh angle that was greater during barefoot squatting. And which means that when they were squatting, they had a very difficult time getting that thigh parallel to the ground. What they saw is that they were able to keep the shank closer to a vertical line. I honestly think that they were able to keep the shank closer to a vertical line because they had limited ankle dorsiflexion. So they really couldn't um, dorsiflex that ankle as well when they went barefoot into shod. Barefoot squat also created seven degrees less knee flexion. Uh, so all of this 2013 study to me is just showing that if you're going to go from a shod squat pattern with your clients into a barefoot squatting pattern, you must have sufficient mobility, particularly in the ankle. All of these results here, kinematic results, are really uh, suggestive of the change in ankle flexibility in the shoes versus barefoot. And we know that that's one of the biggest, um, I guess, downsides of chronically being in shoes is that you lead to restriction in ankle mobility and then you're clearly going to have kinematic changes. So although the study didn't say, yeah, barefoot's awesome, squat barefoot, what it does say is that there's definite compensations when people get out of shoes and go into these squatting patterns that we need to make sure that our clients and our patients have the proper mobility so that they can achieve proper squatting mechanics when they, as soon as they get out of their shoes. That would be my biggest take home from this research study. 
Another research study looked at the potential toe flexors. This is the big focus here. Theme of this PowerPoint is toe flexor muscles to enhance performance. Small group size, 15 subjects, um, looked at heavy resistance strength training, and they did seven weeks. I'm going to show you shortly what they do. And maximal MPJ ankle plantar flexion moments were measured. And again, they, they used that dynamometer. And what they saw is they saw an improvement in the force that was produced. So they saw a strength that was achieved through the flexors. That was through the, that dynamometer. can't say that word. And then um, jumping distance. And when we think about jumping distance, your ability to jump that distance is you actually pushing the ground away from you. So that is going to use a lot of toe flexor strength. One thing that we want to think about, and this is the biggest takeaway that I got from doing all of these <laughs> research studies for this webinar, is thinking about how we're improving or how we can improve our short foot programming. If we see that there's actually higher toe flexor force production and higher toe flexor activation when you have a slight dorsiflexion of your MPJs, that might be the more effective way to actually be building this into our client programming. The way that the contraction was done in this previous study is that they had done three second contractions, three second rest. So over those seven weeks, I think the research study said that they did um, almost 600 contractions of that muscle. With the other study that we had referenced earlier is they did 25 reps at 10 sets. So if you are currently integrating short foot exercise from a performance perspective or a corrective exercise perspective, a function perspective, I want you to think about the ankle position that you're doing it in and even more so, I want you to think about the MPJ position that you're doing it in. If we are just at a flat and only doing short foot at a flat foot 90 degree angle, we are probably not recruiting the flexors as much as we should be to transfer to improved performance or improved function. You want to start pushing them into that plantar flexion angle because it's going to be um, functional. And if you do start to push them into a plantar flex ankle, you want to make sure that the MPJs are dorsiflexing. So again, trying to mimic that push off phase of gait. If you're thinking about the amount of volume that perhaps you're doing with your clients and with your athletes, maybe we're not doing a high enough volume or you're not doing the contraction long enough. This particular study, three seconds on, three seconds off, did the repetitions, um, there was over a period of seven weeks, and then the other one did 25 repetitions by 10 sets. So it's actually quite a high volume that we want to start thinking about. And then, of course, you can integrate it into dynamic movement, which is how I teach it in a lot of the BTS certification. Last area that I want to look at, two last research studies, has to do with barefoot training and cognition. And this is one that... I want to delve in a lot more. Um, we'll have to do a webinar entirely dedicated to barefoot training and cognitive development and thinking of it from both um, extremes as far as uh, footwear when a child is still learning to walk. So you're thinking of you know, three years old and younger and how a lot of people start to put them into shoes way too early. What does that do to cognitive development? And then to the other extreme as seniors and what that does by being in shoes that long and how that plays a role in overall function. So this study 2006 looked at a, it was an explorative study investigating the effects of barefoot running sorry, I had to have one that had to do with running, on working memory. This is a very interesting one. So what they did is they ran both barefoot and shod on a track while stepping on targets. There were little poker chips scattered around. And they compared the memory test when they had to run barefoot, stepping on these targets. So they obviously had to pay attention and be much more controlled in their movements so they don't hurt themselves, versus when they're running in shoes, and then it didn't really matter if they were on these targets or not. 
Main finding was that participants performed better on working memory tests when running barefoot compared to running shod, but that only happened when they were stepping on the targets. So an advantage is that the additional attention that's needed when running barefoot is potentially beneficial to our memory and our brain health. So not just barefoot running, but when you're thinking about integrating different barefoot movements for your clients, particularly those that are aging, having some sort of stimuli that forces them to pay attention to their feet and where they're stepping, how they're moving, does have a improvement on their cognitive function. I think this is an area that's going to have more research, especially as barefoot starts to continue to be a little bit more popular, but just starting out, um, a lot of you professionals can take this research study and start to integrate it with your clients right away. Last study that I want to look at is looking at brain activity during ankle proprioceptive stimulation and how that predicts a balanced performance in young and older adults. So what they did is they stimulated the foot tendon, it was the Achilles tendon, versus stimulating via vibration bone. And as they did this, stimulated, so they were obviously stimulating proprioceptors uh, in the tendon, bone, obviously not any proprioceptors. And they were looking at doing essentially a brain scan as they were doing this to look at brain activity based on that distal proprioceptive stimulation. What they saw is that there was uh, increased brain activity on the right side of the brain when they stimulated the Achilles tendon proprioceptors. They saw that this right side of the brain is involved in monitoring the stimulus driven for attention. So again, um, cognitive function was increased and starting to suggest that there is a higher central processing of these proprioceptive signals. So typically we think of proprioception as um, very much isolated to a peripheral nervous system function and by doing barefoot training, uh, proprioceptive training, you are from a distal perspective training neuromuscular coordination, training those sensory nerves and I often myself will just focus, focus heavy, heavy peripheral nervous system. I think this study is actually very exciting in the sense that it starts to bring in how powerful barefoot training and proprioceptive training can actually be to our cognitive function. If you're actually seeing increased brain activity when you stimulate all the way peripherally, that actually is very uh, strong correlation towards the power of barefoot training, whether we're young or especially as we're aging. So this is the first time I've ever read something like this, and I'm, I'm sorry, it's not going to 2011 study, but I think this is very exciting. So for any of our seniors particularly, we do want to make sure that we are doing um, the proprioceptive training. I'd be very curious to see if there is an increase in brain activity with some of the vibration platforms are out there. So if anyone is big with the power plates and different vibration platforms, um, if they have any research studies looking at those modalities and brain activity. So to summarize, as we started looking at a review of uh, some of the latest research on barefoot training, short foot exercises, toe flexor strength, um, barefoot on performance, and barefoot on brain and cognitive function. I think some of the biggest things that we can take out of this is um, the way that we're doing short foot, the specific angles that we're putting the ankle and the MPJs at. Um, I think the volume that we're doing is important. Um, if we're going to jump into barefoot powerlifting techniques, we need to make sure that our um, clients or athletes have sufficient range of motion. That, that study was great at showing that all of the uh, improper kinematics pretty much presented when they switched from uh, shod to barefoot squatting techniques. And when we start thinking about uh, the role of toe flexor strength in uh, vertical jump and horizontal jump distance, 
huge benefit there. And then, of course, when we're thinking about barefoot from a cognitive function perspective, very, very powerful. I think this shows that barefoot is definitely moving beyond running, and that's the direction that we need to keep it in. Um, it's also showing that barefoot does not just equal balance exercises. We want to think about the foot as a functional structure. And that really the, the most important thing that you want to think about when it comes to intrinsic strengthening is the toe flexors. Those are the most important intrinsic muscles in the foot, and their purpose is propulsion. And, you know, it's the big thing that I push whenever I have my workshops is your, your foot is designed for three things. It's designed for balance. It's designed for the loading of impact forces and energy. And it's designed for propulsion. We're designed to be bipedal human, um, human locomotion beings. Our foot is designed very much for that purpose. And therefore, our intrinsic muscles are designed for that as well. If there are any questions, I will be more than happy to go through some of those questions. And as you're thinking of any questions, please do check out the Barefoot Training Summit that's coming up in New York City. We have an awesome lineup. We are going barefoot strong. And uh, for those who have attended in the past, it's an amazing experience. Uh, $300 for the two days. Uh, worth every single penny. We do offer CECs. Check out barefoottrainingsummit.com. And again, if you want the PDF with the articles that I referenced, I encourage you to check them out a little bit closer and read particularly the methodology that they have. So a couple studies. Um, yes, Linus, I will send you some information. Um, all right, so Frank had a great question as far as how to measure navicular drop. Um, I did a blog on this, and I, I apologize. I wasn't even planning to go down a tangent of how you measure navicular drop, but it's really important. Um, best thing that you can do is if you um, YouTube how to measure navicular drop, essentially what you do is, one, you need to know where the navicular is. If you know for sure that you're on the navicular, great. You want to put the foot open chain at a 90 degree angle. You can put a book against the bottom of the foot and that mimics the ground. You're essentially measuring from the navicular, I would go with the bottom of the navicular to the book, which is mimicking the ground, and measure that height. Take that, that client, have them stand up on the ground, double leg stance or single leg stance, your choice, and then measure again the bottom of the navicular to the real ground, closed chain, and you'll notice a difference. And somebody who truly has navicular drop, which is where um, the navicular kind of slides medially, medially towards the floor, you'll actually notice a significant difference. So 10 millimeters may seem like a lot, but when somebody actually has a pathological navicular drop, you start to recognize it without even doing that, um, that navicular drop test. However, if I were to do a research study myself, that would be the measure that I would follow, is an navicular drop, actually versus subtalar joint eversion. I care more about navicular drop in my patients. All right, so, um, so paper grip test, is this done fully weight-bearing or seated? Great question, you could do it both. It's your choice. I would want to do it in a standing position because, um, again, once you get seated, then you start to change the angles of different joints, the amount of force that you can create. Anything that's fully weight-bearing is obviously going to have a higher muscle activation. You could do it in a plantar flexed ankle, dorsiflexed MPJ position. So you could actually do it in a couple other ones, you can do it in a single leg versus a double leg. There's no real um, set standard because it's very subjective, right? You don't know how much force you're creating with the paper test. But it's something that is super quick and easy. It's also the way that I teach people how to do short foot. As I'll put a, a business card or a piece of paper underneath the foot and tell them not to let me pull it out. And then they get that sensation of what short foot should be because they're not letting me pull that piece of paper. If you have that client that's having trouble understanding what short foot is, 
try it and just say that's exactly what you're going for. Then you take away the paper and then have them mimic that same action and they're technically doing short foot. Okay, so next question, where's my mouse, is um, Yes, so a few questions as far as upcoming workshops. Um, someone is asking for Arizona. I'm going to be in Arizona in October on behalf of NASM. So Linus, if you want to check that out, NASM uh, Optima is the conference. And then Faith, we're not scheduled for Florida right now. However, we're always booking workshops. So I encourage you to check that out at ebfafitness.com and then check out our um, under attend a workshop. Okay, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to email me. Um, we have some great few questions. We are going to wrap up if you don't have any other questions. And again, I would gladly send you this PowerPoint education at ebfafitness.com. Thank you guys so much and have a wonderful night.